What is up, my people? Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church's Sermon Spotlight, where we are coming at you each and every week with a fresh service to debrief in effort to send biblical truth. And what better way to do that than by the power of conversation? I'm Mark Francis. I'm Mark. The host for today. The man, the myth, the Mark Francis. And that's who he is in my household. Hear people's voices. You get the one and only Miss Rose Locke once again. I'm so excited to have you here. I like to be here. I want to add like an applause meter into the background. We need to add applause meter. One of those things, the different Uh buttons, you know what I'm saying? I've got a little Especially for Rose when she's here. That's a good idea. Applauses. Oh, yeah. Boo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And iPad. Buzzers. Down in the choir. Down in the choir room, we have like these like yes and no buttons. And this morning we used the no button. So it's very fun. I think I bought those like 15 years ago. You did. And they're still alive. They were Christmas gifts. Yeah. It was great. So, yes, I'm... I'm glad that you're here, and Rosie did a great job hosting the other oh, that was episode. Fun. That was super fun. That was a few weeks back. I like back. sitting in that She's seat a natural. better, because all you have to do is ask questions and then sit there and watch It's a better it seat. You just look yeah. left, look right. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. You, sometimes you talk a little bit less, and that could be okay, too. So yeah. you're not going to hear much from me today, but you hear from Caleb Pearson, who is the... the I can't say teaching pastor, but I can say you know the, the person in the pulpit. Listen, Mark, you can call right? me whatever you want, buddy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Thanks for having me on. And I will say it was an amazing sermon. Um, gotten tons of feedback from it, but I'm going to come Rose's way first um, to allow her mm-hmm. to just give your perspective. Well, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned in the podcast, I was on the podcast two weeks ago, I think, Mark Carey was here, and I mentioned this like graphic. Did you stick it in the notes of that podcast, Caleb, by chance? Uh, in that podcast, that the link to Don's, we put in the, but we didn't okay. put the graphic in. You didn't in. put the graphic. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mentioned that graphic mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, and thank you, Caleb, for using it, because I think that ca- graphic is really helpful when mm-hmm. we're dealing with prophecy, at least personally for me. It's Define it real quick, which one um, are you talking so about? So I'm talking about the graphic where there's the two mountains. The peaks. Yeah, yep. and so there's the prophet at the bottom, and the prophet can see the peaks, but he can't necessarily see the valleys in between. Mm-hmm. And I think that in this in this particular case, it's really helppful. Um, I I just there there's so many like I looked up the word indigni- ign- indignation indignation mm-hmm. I looked up the word magnify because mm. we throw these words around and I was like you know mm-hmm. what does that really mean and mm. so I thought there was a lot of of cool words that you used Caleb that merited a lot of definition and I also um, one of the things that struck me, frankly, when you called, uh, you have to t- pronounce his name for me, the Greek guy, Antiochus. <laughs> oh, Antiphanes, there are, right? so there are like two different pronunciations oh, for really? both of his names, okay. but I stuck with Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah. Stick with what you know. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there good you job go. practicing it and giving us oh, all, at yeah. least a baseline for it. But yeah. one of the things that struck me about your sermon and you bringing up him was this idea that Satan, his attempt to destroy God's plan right? Mm-hmm. So his attempt, because I, I wrote the dates down, 175 to 160, 164 years before Christ, mm-hmm. Satan attempts hmm. to destroy the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Like he attempts to do away with all sacrifice and attempting, probably knowing full well the promise that Christ is going to come through that line. And so uh, it just struck me you ca- you calling him the Hitler of the ancient world, and then seeing the dates that he lived. This idea that um, these prophecies shouldn't surprise us, and the breaking off of these horns and things, because Satan is trying really hard to thwart God's mm-hmm. plans, right? And how time and time and time again, God just shows his his faithfulness to fulfill his plans and his promises, despite what men might try to do. You know, mm-hmm. it just struck me. So. Yeah. No, That's for cool. sure. And there is a lot to unpack. And there's oh, yeah. a lot that you covered an entire chapter yeah. full of, like you said, crazy things. You know, you got the crazy stories and, and flying, you got goats, the flying, flying goats, goats, and the crazy who can't visions. Walk, yeah. you know? Don't have wings. So, I, I, I love that. I mean, when Mark first approached me, he said, Listen, you're you're getting Daniel three, but you're also getting Daniel eight. And I I loved it. I wanted the challenge. He said, yeah. you know, for all intents and purposes, you're getting an easy one and you're getting a hard one. And so it was it was fun to do that when I went to worship team a couple weeks before. I was like, I'm, I'm going to try to tie in Mother's Day to a vision about goats, but it's not going to be easy. And so I was really kind of wrestling with that. I did want to share this story. Like Rose and the team, they they work so well with the speaking pastor to make sure the service is, is seamless and goes accordingly. But I was really like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And you had sent an email saying like, it could be, it could be cool to pray, to, to pray over the mothers and hear some reasons why. And so I was like, yeah, I, I definitely could agree with that. 
And so I went to FSAT, prepared for the whole intro of the sermon to just be me praying mm. for the mothers. But Dave Compton did such a great job mm. right before I went up. So I was like, okay, like he nailed it. Like his mm -hmm. prayer was so good. So mm -hmm. instead I just kind of tied into like, oh, we're, we're magnifying our moms this weekend, but the, but the text is gonna magnify something else. So I kind of went that route mm -hmm. instead. Same thing Sunday morning. I was prepared to pray, but Tim LeMay did such a great mm -hmm. job, mm -hmm. emotionally so, praying that I just felt like, okay, that really, I think that really scratched that itch, so to speak. So part of me was like, I'm glad Rose is on the podcast because you sent me an email saying like, it'd be so cool to pray over the moms. And then I didn't, but I loved our service and how it honored Mother's Day, uh, and also gave us time to to continue our series because these are two. Not if we push pause have, on that, like, there's no Venn diagram. Yeah, but then, let's pause uh, that for a second. Cause, yeah, because I we're after, probably thinking the same thing. So yeah, go ahead. Well, maybe, but maybe not. But after <laughs> I've sat, I went to Mike Lukens and I said, you know, Mike, that service was very heartwarming to me. Mm. And one of the things that the I, Saturday night one, the Saturday night. Well, okay. Saturday night is my first taste of something coming to sure. life. That I have like makes sense. I mean, I've shared this before on the podcast. One of my roles here is I pour through those services. I was just now pouring through next weekend, mm. and I think about what is God doing in this service, and what is it going to look like, and how are these transitions going to work, and how is everything pointing us towards? Like I ask those questions and mm -hmm. think that those things. So Saturday becomes my first taste of what it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's almost like having a baby. You talk about a mother. It's almost <laughs> like having a baby to me because, like, mm -hmm. okay, this is something that that we've dreamed and envisioned and prayed through, and now what is God going to... Basically, then I get to sit back and say, okay, right, God, right. now what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I told Mike after Saturday, I felt like it, it had this feeling, it's, it's a feeling that we all strive for, of being part of a small body, even mm -hmm. though it's a large body, because mm -hmm. it had just this, into each service had one family mm -hmm. that attends that service that dedicated their children, mm -hmm. right? And only one family. And each service had someone who was intimately connected with that service do lead that right. time. And I just felt like it had this, um, this sense of a small local body about the service and mm -hmm. celebrating Mother's Day in a way that wasn't forced, but was celebrative and mm -hmm. honoring to God. And I appreciated the way you connected things, Caleb. Yeah. And being spiritually really aware service. of that is super right. helpful. Yeah. Right. And what I thought you were going to say was the connection of the, the content overall. And, and Rose, you do pour over not just trying to imagine what is the service going to be like, but the script and the content of what's happening. And the worship team did not intentionally plan this, but you spotted it early, middle of the week, to say there is a strong theme of the love of the Father, the mm -hmm. love of God. And we didn't know if you were going to touch on that, and you didn't right, even right. have to. Right. But as a worship team, typically we might, we might talk about the love of the Father on Father's Day, not mm -hmm. necessarily Mother's Day, Right. but it it came in in Ephesians 3 passage that was a prayer of, for mm -hmm. to know the depths of love of God. And then some of the, the parents used a, a similar passage um, mm -hmm. that was just describing the, to know God more and to know his love. To know his, the depth and, of his and love. And then there is a, a Psalm 103 passage that, that spoke to that. And then it concludes with songs that spoke to the Father. It was just, yeah. it was a neat kind of way of just mm -hmm. seeing the Spirit package so many different elements together mm -hmm. that there was a consistent theme of, yes, God is on display. Mm -hmm. And for you to wrap up the sermon in a way that pointed people to magnify the Lord, mm -hmm. um, to me, that that was amazing. And it kind of came a little bit out of just like, wow, where did that come from? But it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it really is because that word kept appearing in the, yeah, in the, chapter, that, the chapter, that these yeah. people... That it, these images magnify themselves, magnify themselves, because that's a wrestle. You're, you're studying Old Testament, you're studying Daniel, application today, that's so difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a 75-minute a biblical training center class. It's a 40-minute sermon. And so one of, as I was preparing for it, I was like, man, I really want to, you want prophecy to be approachable or, or to be palatable or to almost be like, uh, communicated in such a way that it doesn't have to be for the crazy, you know, you picture a guy with crazy hair and a corkboard behind him in order to, to read prophecy. All scripture's profitable. So how can we learn about this Antiochus guy? How can we study all these figures? And and what I felt like was a pretty quick pace on the, the front half to mm -hmm. kind of get through the vision yeah. so that 
the emphasis was on the substance of the vision reminding us of the source of the vision instead, because I do think that's where the application comes from, the source of the vision. And that's what I love talking about in these episodes, well, what's I, the purpose of this, to really flush mm-hmm. out that I application. I really appreciate it. I mean, to kind of bring it down to like what I think is an everyman level in a sense, I appreciated your like direct assault on our definition of prophecy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. we do. We think of like palm readers and, it, it, you know, like... Right what day and what time is Christ mm-hmm. gonna come back? And mm-hmm. like, we think of prophecy in that way. And I just appreciated, Caleb, you're like kind of calling that out, that that's kind of not what biblical prophecy does most of right. the time. And the whole number, the 23, what is that, 2300? 2, 2, e- yeah. That whole number, that's a highly unusual thing mm-hmm. to see inside. Right. You know? Yeah, and, and so some of the things that didn't really get addressed is there there is a little horn in Daniel 7, uh, there's really not a whole lot of indication that this is also that 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 was Antiochus. Mark didn't say that little horn was Antiochus, but when you see these numbers, when you see these little horns, and you study what I would say, if you study a lot of scripture superficially, it's going to be very easy to make connections to immediately only perhaps apply. Okay, Daniel, it's a prophecy about Revelation. Yeah, but no, because there was a Jewish fulfillment to it as well. So that's where the graphic came in. And that's the hard, sticky stuff. It really is. And that's where I I admire how Mark humbly declared he didn't know an answer to a question a couple weeks ago. You took his lead, right? I I very much so did. It it gave me the clarity and composure I needed and the reminder to be like, okay, I don't need to get up there and professor my way through this. I, I can go up there with an element of like, (laughs) <laughs> here's what I've researched, here's what I've studied, here's what's clear. The question, do we know enough, is answered, I think, so that, I don't know, we can all continue this kind of a conversation mm-hmm. about it. Yeah, there are other things that intrigue me um, yeah. that are not maybe as spiritual as some of the things we're talking about. But like, I'm intrigued by, we do not necessarily in our culture today, we tend to raise the Greek culture mm-hmm. and Alexander the Great, and we tend to raise the Roman culture, right? Julius Caesar and all mm-hmm. of that. But we don't tend to talk much in our culture about the Medes and the Persians, right? Mm-hmm. But here they are right alongside of Greece, mm-hmm. as mentioned as this like important enough for prophetic <clears throat> right. words, right? Mm-hmm. So we don't see, you know, the the Ming dynasty of China or, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. not to my CC roots, the Songhai of Africa or the Indus River Valley civilization. Like we don't see them called out directly, but the Medes and the Persians seem to have mm-hmm. played a more important historic role than we in our contemporary culture give them. So there's mm-hmm. just so many things in here that are intriguing yeah. about world history. And, and it's, it's also a reminder that this text is difficult for a different reason than some other Bible passages are. We actually get the interpretation of the vision in the chapter. Mm-hmm. So it's, it is, to per your question earlier, Mark, the difficulty is getting people to care about it and opening our eyes enough to say, okay, uh, can I sort through this and leave with something or be encouraged by something that it, that is the ultimate reminder? And so that's where kind of the application came from. But I'm glad to hear you heard good feedback on yeah. it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I want to cover like, some more of the application components. Yeah. But before we do that, I want to ask you as well. I mean, the passage does give the interpretation, which does make it kind of easy. Sure. But then there's also a lot of challenging mm-hmm. parts about it. So mm-hmm. what did you find challenging? What did you feel like that you needed to, yeah. to cover in right. depth? Which, right. I, I mean, I know kind of you covered that whole day timeline in depth. You, you felt that that, that was mm-hmm. necessary to give five minutes to. Right. So right. what yeah. would the wrestling it's a, look like it's for a, you with it that? It feels like a catch-22 because you're like, sweet, straight from the mouths of angels, we're going to get the interpretation of the vision. Verse 20, clear as day. They tell them exactly what that element of the vision vision means. But as the angels progress, they get vaguer and vaguer with their language and allude to basically a conclusion of like, Daniel, keep this thing secret. It's going to be for a, a time appointed in the future. So they, they leave him hanging to a certain degree on what's happening to the point where he doesn't he doesn't reach a conclusion in the chapter. Daniel doesn't reach a, I fully understand what's going on. He, mm-hmm. He's left sick, exhausted. There's a, a physical or a mental, emotional toll on him. And so I I felt a little burdened to say, okay, Lord, like help me not add to the text 
with this sermon. I'll, I'll be silent where the text is silent. If some people leave in the same spot Daniel was left, come back next week, because I'm excited to, to talk about Daniel 9, because yeah, it's sure. going to be a very wonderfully timed mm-hmm. breath of fresh air where we're going to understand how how he's doing with all of this. Um, but t- to your question more specifically, the, the 2300 days thing, I, I was fascinated at how many scholars dive into that and reach the same conclusion mm-hmm. that God God's accounted for this thing, mm-hmm. that this prophecy fits. Mm-hmm. I, I, I felt like that was a valuable example to that idea of let's not lose sight of the forest for the trees. Like we, that's easy to do in the Christian walk. I'll argue about this tree or that tree, mm-hmm. and before you know it, we're not all leaving united because of God. We're leaving right. divided because of Christianese. And we've argued over something that we is, weren't meant to argue. Yeah, yeah, and what and and wasn't the point of the passage. Right. So and the now question we've is the sight of the love of God, right? right? Mm-hmm. Which yep. is. And that's important. and to magnify him. And, and whether that's inherently true of all biblical prophecy, I don't know. I'd have to keep studying it. But I think there's a lot of things that can pop up that aren't the point, but they're so fascinating and they catch your attention. My example I brought up this weekend was angelology. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning so yeah. much I about, about angels. That. You briefly touched on. I was waiting for you to say and listen to the sermon spotlight. But we yeah. can we can talk about it now. Is there yeah. anything that you do feel like that you missed out on or could have spent more time in? Is that one of them? Yeah, I think it's one of them. I mean, this idea that angels are so uh, sweet and approachable or kind when they arrive, or they're so easily understood, the idea that it's the children's book picture of an angel, like not even close. Daniel fell to his face twice when Gabriel got closer. There's a fear element. There's a submission to authority element. One of the things that I, so I went a couple weeks ago in his sermon, Mark mentioned um, the Jacob's Ladder. Mm-hmm. vision, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I went there to Genesis 28 mm-hmm. and read through that passage again. And I was intrigued by how similar the view that Jacob has of God is to the view of Daniel has to like, mm-hmm. and I started to become very intrigued by the consistency. I mean, we're talking hundreds of years apart, but there is this consistency in when God reveals himself to his people in visions um, to how he reveals himself. And and there, same exact thing. He was afraid mm. and said, this place is awesome. Mm-hmm. And so it's like every single time yep. when people are confronted with God, there's similarities in his look. Mm-hmm. He's surrounded by these otherworldly beings. We'll call mm-hmm. them angels, for mm-hmm. lack of a better word. And people respond with fear. And it is like it is the similar word for awesome. Like it's that respect fear, but Mm -hmm. it's also a legitimate fall on my face fear. Mm -hmm. So I'm just very intrigued that to me, to me, that is just another evidence that this is the same, the same God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. Like it's a great point. And it's it's also a reminder that like our exposure to the spiritual realm, it's something we desperately crave. I, I don't know sometimes. I mean, I, I wonder how often we want, oh, I wish an angel could come down through my bedroom ceiling and just tell me what's up. Read Daniel uh, 8, and you're kind of like, it, it It put him to the floor, and then he was sick for a week. And it was scary. It was fear. And, and there was like this wild exposure to glory. And we have that throughout the Bible as well. When there's this un, in, unordinary like ex- exposure to God, it's takes yeah, a toll. It, it's like this dual thing, like even um, this morning in our worship team meeting, we were reading the beginning of Revelation, right? Mm. The same thing, there's like this dual, like like bright light and overwhelming, indescribable um, whiteness, right. right? That people are exposed to, but there is this like immediate mm-hmm. fall down on my face in fear simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Hebrew, Hebrews 1, 5. To which of the angels did God ever say, you, you are my son, today I have become your father? Hebrews 1, uh, verse 8, but about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever. Then verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand? And it, the book of Hebrews starts to kind of unpack, well, well, our identity isn't in the angels, our identity is in Christ. And and I, I, I think there's biblical claim to this idea that Angels are not these omniscient uh, robots that are on the same level playing field as God. They they look at us. We're the ones God died for. We're the ones Jesus died for. And and I think they watch us with intriguing curiosity the same way we want to we yeah. want to look at them with sure. intriguing curiosity. And so I love that little back and forth <clears throat> where where the angel says, "How long is this going to occur? 
And and that's what's so weird about the way it's written too. The, the, the chapter starts, I saw a vision and it was of me, myself, looking. And it's like, okay, thanks, Daniel. This is already weird. It, it's meta, it's, it's, it's redundant. But then the angels, an angel was speaking and then the one who was speaking was speaking to the one who was speaking and he was asking. And I was like, Daniel, like, I don't know if that's the Hebrew or what, but like simplify this for us, please. But it's cool that we got a name. And, we, got, we got a Gabriel. And right? you can I mean, tell it's chaotic, you, 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 right? You, you could s- tell it's chaotic. Yeah. For me to read that and go, that seems chaotic. Well, yeah, I can't imagine what it was like for Daniel to have an angel speaking and then while that angel speaking another one saying hey 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 wait how long is all this going to happen like what a weird almost earthly dialogue we get from mm-hmm. angels mm-hmm. There, it's not one coming through the clouds with a beautiful prophecy right <laughs> you you shall find love you faithful <laughs> follower of god the, they appear daniel faints and then the angels are asking questions i love that that points to the supremacy of god and nothing else and so to to mention that because the text does, but then to instead jump into the Antiochus has to be addressed. And so it's like, that was a cutting room floor thing that, that you could totally BTC class it up That's cool. and get into angelology, I think. Well, That's cool. And I think like one of the things, again, very mundane and very common in a sense, but I love that the chapter ends with, I rose up again and did the king's work. Yeah. Like, kept okay, going. Kept thanks going. Thanks God, like, but yep. what else is, I? you know, that was amazing, mm-hmm. but what else is there to do except what you have appointed? Like, like I, right. all I can come around to is that that was the work that God had appointed for Daniel. Mm-hmm. And so like, okay, I'm gonna reveal this to you. I'm going to encourage your heart in a sense because, um, you know, there's this idea throughout, through the, this part, part of Daniel, there's this idea that Daniel was just on his knees praying for, for the restoration of mm-hmm. what he had been removed. He was praying for his culture. He desired to go home. He desired for the sacrifices to resume at the temple. Like, mm-hmm. And so it's in a sense, it's almost like God encourages his heart, reveals himself to him, allows him to see something of himself, and then Daniel gets up and goes back to work, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can we give some just uh, application? Yeah, yeah. Because so, you, you, you only spent a few minutes on right, it. But, right. But um, there there is something to, obviously, prophecies mm-hmm. that is biblical, that it, one-fifth of Scripture is mm-hmm. giving that. We've been wrestling with this for a couple of weeks now. Mm-hmm. We're going to continue to wrestle with it. This prophecy has been fulfilled as right. you unpacked. Mm-hmm. And so one of your questions is part of the application points is, so what? So right. why now? Big deal. Yeah. yeah. So even after the, right. the sermon over the weekend, went out and hung out with my sister who's from a town in California. And she's seen some of our services before. And, you know, we and some family members were talking. She's like, man, so that was a good point that Caleb brought up. It's like, what does it mean to me now? Mm-hmm. Why? You know, and we, we wrestle with that as a family. Mm-hmm. And, and so I wanted to encourage us now to be like, okay, what, what is coming to the forefront? Mm-hmm. You brought up a couple of them, but like, are there more? Mm-hmm. And, and starting with the magnification of the Lord right. is one big one. But I, right. I'll throw it your way first. Yeah. Kevin, and then Rose yeah. Chime and, in. and that was the tension that, you know, you, you, the time's running out, you get to application. It's like, okay, we did all of a chapter in one, one sitting, so to speak. How can we, how can we? you know, prime the pump for application. But that idea of counting on God, I think, is so key because if he has delivered in this way and always has, if he's been true to his word and he always has, it's so fascinating that each of us has an opportunity to then say, oh, okay, despite your resume, God, Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to seriously question whether you're in control right now. Mm -hmm. But But that happens all the time. Right, uh, the unrest I'm experiencing in Frederick County on a Thursday afternoon, <laughs> I'm beginning to question God if you have it all in control. And so that's where I think counting on God based on everything we've read is counting on God due to biblical dependency and not due to my own experience. So for Daniel to say, I can trust God with my future, and we are beyond that future that we can actually prove and see that it was handled to the point, I brought this out, that scholars, biblical scholars are erring on the side of, well, Daniel 8 must have not been right. written then. So that detailed. is very, yeah. that is a very unfortunate but powerful reality that we are now dealing with where, where people who want to honor this text are so impressed by that prophecy being for they go, okay, well, no, uh, Daniel couldn't have known that. Right. I even read something, um, this is kind of an aside, but... Mm-hmm or heard something rather about the book of Daniel and scholars because it's so specific, particularly about Greece. Right. Um, And I, and 
in the beginning of Daniel, there's a place where they talk about the different instruments that mm-hmm. played, and some of those instruments have the names of them are Greek mm. in their origin. So the fact that those Greek instruments would be mentioned in the beginning of Daniel, they were pointing as evidence that this was written much later. But mm. then um, someone was telling me about that they discovered in Egypt from a similar time period, the names of those same Greek instruments. So it's not <laughs> yeah. like Greece didn't exist before Alexander the Great. R- so right, the country itself right. existed, obviously, because yep. they wouldn't mention Greece to Daniel. If it and I'd be wondering, like, how? Yeah. They're probably thinking, who is Greece? Why, no, is, it, why actually, is Greece coming out? It was, yeah. And that's they're a help. somewhat powerful. And that's yeah, a reminder, yeah. too. Like, they just hadn't conquered the whole sure. world. Right. Yeah. right. Sure. And, and what we get of these visions is, is kind of God's view of what's going on, and we have to measure it against what we've been taught. Like we've been taught America's view on Greece in, in our history classes. That's that's fine and good. But God's view on everything that has been happening is a little bit different. There are going to be nations he accounts for in the prophecies. You're right. Clear other time periods that, that aren't in here. I mean, that's a whole, and then that's the other thing too is I think you then you get into the canonicity of scripture and when it closed and how it's applicable. If I can get people to arrive at the question, how is this applicable for me? That that's a much healthier question to leave with then did I just waste my time? Like you, you, it, it can be helpful to leave church going, wow, I'm encouraged by that and that was good. And, and the service wide, I'm encouraged by everything we, mm-hmm. we read, prayed and sung. Mm-hmm. Um, so counting and I, on God. And I wanna learn more, but, well, but yes. One. I mean, one of the things I'll, I'll just chime in application wise, um, and it's kind of funny because I actually wrote down Philippians, you came to Philippians 2, mm-hmm. Caleb, mm-hmm. at the end of your sermon, and I actually had written down Philippians 2 before you got to Philippians mm. 2 in my notes, mm. because I think this idea that men magnify themselves mm. and are knocked down, mm-hmm. like we can magnify, we can make ourselves great all day long. Mm-hmm, right. I'm the best mom, I'm the best, you know, whatever we're best at or think we're best at all day long. Mm-hmm. Christ magnified himself. God magnified Christ through his death. Mm-hmm. And that makes our God so unique. And, He'd have to be different. And yeah. and the idea of humbling yourself in that same way is mm-hmm. so antithetical to mm-hmm. our flesh mm-hmm. and what our flesh wants to do. But even in this vision, we see, Caleb, exactly that application. All of these men, and let's face it, none of us are Alexander the Great. None of us, like mm-hmm. Alexander the Great was a great man and a great general. And so was Constantine. And so was Julius Caesar. And like these were great men of our history because we still know their names. Mm-hmm. But they're dead and they're dead by human hands. Yeah, and and you know? I had people come up to me going like, wow, I never knew about this Antiochus guy or I never knew there was this Hitler of the ancient world. Okay, we're, we're privileged then. We didn't even know there was an, another Hitler, so to speak, right? <laughs> Surveying America now, it's like, oh, we'll never forget about Hitler, the Germany Hitler, right? Like it's, but this stuff's been happening and when you realize how many dominoes have fallen, you're a lot less scared of the ones still standing. And it's this, it's this perspective and, and that's the, where the counting on God comes into play of we're thrown into this world, A, we're born sinners, there's the theological foundation for it all, but we're gonna be tossed to and fro by everything that's happening, and so it is studying prophecy, it is going through the Old Testament at times and and wrestling with our text to realize, holy smokes, God has not changed once, he's been faithful every time, and one thing that continually challenges me in my faith, even as far as stamina and ministry, is wait a second, which camp do I wanna belong to? The, the one who remains faithful to God despite all this stuff or the one who, well, based on what's happened in my life since 1996, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question the God on the throne. And it's just, if you maintain a large view of self, that's going to, not that anyone is doing this in my mind, but if you maintain a large view of self, there's not one single sermon that's going to knock that peg down for you. And that, what fulfilled prophecy shows us mm-hmm. is that God is in complete control. He's worth and counting we can't on. Can't change His plans mm-hmm. at all. Right. These guys, that are kings or generals mm-hmm. or great men, whatever, come and go. Mm-hmm. And like you said, they're puffing themselves up. They're magnifying right. themselves, which I still right. love right. to unpack that word. But we're called to magnify mm-hmm. God. That there is this just great supreme all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, uh, and mm-hmm. all-righteous, holy God mm-hmm. who is 
doing his plan and his works, and we still know what he has said has happened, Mm -hmm. what he has said is going to happen will happen, and we can't change it, and we're all part of that process. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, how do we respond to that? And and, and that's a perfect... We have to respond to that with just, man... Fall and, our faces and, and, and you're, magnify God. you're asking such a great question because what we're going to get into in Daniel nine is a question that could be begged. Well, if if God's not going to change, why do I need to do anything? Mm. If I can't change Him, why do why why should I pray? Mm. If mm-hmm. God's going to do what God's yeah, going to do, right. why should I pray for anything? Yep. That's a that's a I don't want to say healthy, but it's a it's a likely question we can ask. And Daniel nine's going to jump into that a little bit for a us, but there. but. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so that yeah that that magnified again the the repetition of that word sound Bible study you're going to find this stuff um, that 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 idea of t- to grow or become important to promote to to magnify uh, beyond what is natural naturally there but to inflate almost it's something that God wouldn't need to do <laughs> one of my favorite passages mm-hmm. Psalm 34 we're going to okay. touch on it this coming weekend mm-hmm. in our well, is, that's time. the one i read isn't it yeah okay but yeah. i will bless the lord at all times his mm-hmm. praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul will make its boast in the lord the humble will hear it and rejoice mm-hmm. oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name together there's so much to unpack with that but just the oh, yeah. magnifying the lord with I me and let but, but us I exalt him. Remember. but don't you understand like yeah. like we're oh. if we're the church age yep. and to the picture we started the podcast with the valley between the peaks yep. we are called to magnify yeah. the name of the lord so it's not it's not that christ was so humble that the that the uh supposed lesson is we don't need to magnify god anymore uh, no, that's our job. Jesus needed to take on something that we couldn't. So he wasn't here to magnify. Mark's been alluding to this, the whole study of Daniel and prophecy and like when Jesus came and there were things that didn't happen with the stone, the, the prophecy of the stone coming. But Jesus came and then ascended back up and and nothing happened. It wasn't the spectacle we thought it'd be. Jesus' first coming was not the spectacle anybody thought it would be. And the second coming will be a spectacle nobody's even remotely ready to handle. And so it's our awareness of that We're called the point people and our have. duty, yeah. per the Great Commission and, and otherwise, is that it's our job, our, our privilege, to magnify the name of the Lord because he humbled himself and we are now in him. It goes back to Christ's prayer in John, right? That yeah. may glorify, I have mm-hmm. glorified you and now may my disciples mm-hmm. glorify you. Um, and I, I don't know if you guys remember, this has been a very, very, very long time ago. Maybe you remember Mark Francis. Um, I'll try. We did a summer. <laughs> in the summer, the worship team kind of often does, uh, I'll call it a worship series. Like we kind of, we we decide kind of what we feel like the singing times. And like the, for the services, sermon, you mean? Yeah, before mm-hmm. the sermon mm-hmm. time um, focus will be. And oh my gosh, it's been a long time ago. We did, oh, magnify mm-hmm. the Lord with me. Let us yeah. exalt his name together. And we actually had a giant magnifying glass on the stage. I made it out of PVC mm-hmm. pipe in a can and tin can. Um, but inside that magnifying glass, we, um, selected an attribute of God that we were going to choose to magnify in that particular service. And I think mm-hmm. our conversation cool. here is mm-hmm. alluding to that because I always say, like, I feel like, um, obviously, in our worship times, we want to um, we want to always magnify the Lord. We want to glorify His name. We want to remember Christ's death on the cross for us. But I think that there are different facets of God. We can never understand or explain every facet, but we can certainly focus on one of those facets. And so I think there are so many things about God that can be magnified or made greater. Mm-hmm. Um, magnify simply means to make something bigger. Right? It's no mm-hmm. different than the kid with the magnifying glass and an insect, right? Mm-hmm. Or as Mike Lukens likes to say, a telescope at the moon, right? Mm-hmm. We're just making something that, in the case of the moon, we're making something that's huge yep. but far away bigger. More palatable, yeah. Or in the case of a kid with a magnifying glass, we're making something that's really tiny, like more important words there, make, our, making greater, but it's yeah. our perspective. Yes, mm-hmm. it's our perspective. And it's, 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 Putting into clarity, focus is a word that yeah. you use, and mm-hmm. and making it greater. Yeah, I like the telescope because the moon is pretty big, <laughs> but it looks tiny to us. Right. And so if you magnify it with a telescope, then you can see it in a much grander way, and then you're like, oh, mm-hmm. there are some of the craters. Yeah. There are some of the things that are happening there. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't make the moon any less small. It's it it is big what and it is and we are our perspective of it changes and, that, and that's the that subtle that's another subtle application of this past weekend it wasn't a, its own slide or whatever but but I 
pe- biblical prophecy is a weighty reminder that God is in control. Like if, we, if that can land with us mm-hmm. so that any time we come across biblical prophecy, before we argue about the trees, before we <laughs> get way are... into it and, and, and how many days and what about, blah, 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 well, let's remember that what we're about to learn and read and study and ask about is a weighty reminder that God is in control. Because the point is not to fully understand the vision. The point is to realize, wow, if I just got that vision, a glimpse of God's perspective on things, and some of it I understand, it is a logical, normal conclusion to, to say the source of that vision must know exactly must know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then that's where there's an opportunity for faith, right? As Daniel is in this communion with God, something's driving him. And I don't think it's all the wonderful angelic answers he's getting. In fact, it's the angelic answers that made him so scared and sick for a couple days. But he's given an opportunity. As the Lord's revealing himself to Daniel, attached to it is an opportunity to wait on the Lord. And, and that's, been, that's true throughout the whole entire Bible. Look at the way people ask Jesus questions, and he would answer their question with a question, and he would have them thinking about something way different than the thing they came to him with. God's been doing that with his people to, to, to breed faith, I think, and it's such a beautiful reminder, the whole book of Daniel, and that God is sovereign that, and in control. If we recognize that he's the source of all those things, and we get just a glimpse of that perspective, mm-hmm. and we then respond, and, oh, wow, okay. Yep. That is a God that I can trust. Right. And that is a God that I need to get to know better. And that's unity. We can unite around that. This yeah. didn't happen this weekend, but if it did, somebody were to come up to me, I disagree with you on the on the little horn. Okay. Do you trust God with the little horn? Because we can disagree on the little horn, but if we disagree on whether or not we trust God with it, well, let's wrestle with that instead. Because if we can agree on that, do we know enough? And, and can we unite around what we're called to unite around in, in God's word and in our church community? It's still fun to wrestle with a little bit. It is fun, and we as should. As long as we and that's, love one another mm-hmm. in the process, right? And that's, and again, lead by example. Mark has done a great job for, for me, and I'm, I'm sure t- Tim shares this as we all are sharing the load of Daniel. Like Mark has mentioned, there are godly scholars on certain both sides of an issue at times, and it actually can be healthy for us to have a, a discourse over it, a civil discourse that says, okay, wow, these Christians, they're, it's not that they're throwing it away because it's too hard to deal with. That, that's another thing I didn't want to come across, and I, I don't think I did, but this weekend is I don't want to just be like, Forget about that. But instead, like, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Because look at all the letters Paul wrote. They didn't keep the main thing the main thing. They got in the weeds. And so that's something to avoid. Don't let it happen that's to right. us. Don't let it happen. Well, yeah. we're all, as we know here, we kind of wrap up here the, the whole idea of being prepared mm-hmm. and deployed. We, we're being prepared, not just on a sermon, not mm-hmm. just on a weekend, but mm-hmm. we're constantly growing in our faith together as a body of believers. And then we are deployed throughout the course of the week. We gather and scatter. And so that's the course of our seasons of each week. And that's why we gather to be reminded of these things. And we have continual conversations like listening to this episode or talking amongst your people in your community group or walking down a path with your family like I did. Mm-hmm getting a chance to rest with these things, get to know God more. And that's why the church does ministries. So here's my segue. Mm-hmm. There's things that are consistently happening around our church that allow you to grow, connect, and serve, and be prepared and deployed in that way. Mm-hmm. So just things that you're going to be hearing about coming up down the road. Um, there's going to be, uh, we're in the middle of a two-week um, biblical training center course of mm-hmm. conflict. So check that second week out if you want to this coming weekend. There will be a whole new summer series for Biblical Training Center um, on the one and others. That's going to be really neat. Go to the website to see all those schedule and details. We're going to have um, a a pause in the book of Daniel for just one week when Don Den Hartog comes, Mm -hmm. where he's going to unpack the Olivet Discourse, and, and he's going to show us how that Matthew 24 and 25 passage that Jesus teaches on is a bridge between Daniel and Revelation. And it'll be a part of the weekend gatherings on that second weekend of June. And then there'll be a Sunday night class and a Monday night class for part two and part three. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be some really cool ways for us to see some application, I think. Mm -hmm. You're smiling. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? I just love me some Don and Hartog, dude. (laughs) And it's going to be so good. And I'm I'm glad we're devoting some time to that because it really deserves... It deserves time, yep. uh, and and we can honor the text and interpret it well, but it'll be good to have some extended. We need to get him here. 
We got to. Oh, yeah. I, I got to talk to him about getting him in this booth for the follow up sermon spotlight on that. Oh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be mad at him if he doesn't. All right, I'll we'll, make it happen. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah, we'll get him. Will we'll get him. Here? Is he here for longer than just yeah, the weekend? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Perfect. I'm going to try to get him for a different podcast episode as well. Yeah. So we'll, nice. we'll pin him down. Sweet. But um, so just those are just some small examples of how we can yeah. continue in our faith to grow and connect and serve. And then there's plenty of other summer opportunities, whether it be VBS or things that we can pray for with people going to family camp out, out west. Mm-hmm. So much. And so just thank you guys for continually watching and listening and share your thoughts with us share your questions you can go to the fbcva.org slash podcast um, location to type in your questions and responses and reactions and remember we've also got those other podcasts out there whether it be the fellowship family or the global church um, and even listening to the sermons if you missed that so Mm -hmm. Rose, thank you for being here. My pleasure. I love it. Very fun. I I have all my colors. There's still stuff on the cutting room floor of this episode. Uh, (laughs) Oh yeah. You know we can keep bringing it back. But Mm -hmm. Caleb, thanks for being in the pulpit. Yeah, absolutely. And for you guys watching and listening, thanks again. And until we chat again, sermons are not meant to take an hour, but rather transform a lifetime. Until next week, much love and God bless. 